Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight uh, for the presentation by Professor Domingo Morel, who's going to be sharing his research and talking about the book that he has published called Takeover Race, Education, and American Democracy. My name is Ellen Charletta, and I am the director of the Center for Urban and Regional Excellence here at Indiana University Northwest. And we are happy to have you with us this evening. I'll tell you a little bit about the center. The center is the liaison um, unit for the university between the community and the university. What we do is we engage both the university and the community in the creation of positive and impactful programs and initiatives. We work collaboratively collaboratively in order to accomplish this with all different sectors, nonprofit, for-profit, and um, the public sector to promote continued learning, uh, solution-based interactions, as well as mutually beneficial partnerships. And tonight's presentation is just one such initiative. We're looking forward to learning more from Professor Morell as he shares his knowledge and expertise on the topic of takeovers. Professor Morell is joining us from Rutgers University, Newark. He is an assistant professor in uh, political science at Rutgers. He is also an affiliate member of the Global Urban Studies Program and the Center on Law, Inequality, and Metropolitan Equity. He received his PhD in political science from Brown University in 2014. His research program is uh, and his teaching is focused in these areas, racial and ethnic politics, urban politics, education politics, and public policy. Specifically, he seeks to explore the ways in which state policies help to either expand or diminish political inequality among the historically marginalized populations. His current research is examining how the increasing presence of state governments in urban affairs after the 1960s affected Black and Latino political empowerment in our US cities. He is widely published in academic journals. He's written multiple book chapters and he's written two books. Uh, and a third one is about to be forthcoming in 2022. So uh, the, the first book that I'd like to highlight is Latino Mayors, Power and Political Change in the Post-Industrial City. The book about which he'll be speaking this evening is Takeover, Race, Education, and American Democracy. And then his forthcoming book is noted there as well, Developing Scholars, Race, Politics, and the Pursuit of Higher Education. Thank you, Dr. Morell, for joining us this evening. We are looking forward to having you uh, speak and share your knowledge with us. And it's off to you now. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Charlotte, for, for the introduction and for inviting me to, to share this, you know, my, my research uh, in what I consider a very important topic, particularly for your community and uh, the Gary community in Indiana. So uh, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so I have um, been studying state takeovers for over a decade now. I started as a PhD student at Brown University, became interested in the subject. And at the time when I first started to do the research, um, there was, you know, the, the majority of the research was focused on questions of education, right? So when a state takeover happens, uh, what are the implications for educational outcomes, like, you know, test scores, graduation rates, and things like that. Um, but I, I, I became interested in, you know, as a political science uh, scholar, interested in political questions. And there's, there's many reasons to think about, you know, think about what are the implications of state takeovers on politics and uh, how they affect communities and uh, politically. Uh, so for instance, we know that um, when uh, uh, other venues of politics have been closed off to marginalized populations, education has always been at the forefront of fighting for more voice, fighting for more participation, fighting to have a, a, a place in our citizenry, right? And we also know based on the scholarship that 
uh, the schools serve as the entry point for political office holding for African American communities and Latino communities and so forth, right? So um, before we get black mayors or black members of city uh, councils, we get uh, black members on the city uh, on the school board or Latino members members on the school board. And so that for these reasons, it was important to think about what are the implications of state takeovers uh, on democracy and, and politics. And so one of the, you know, as I started to gather information, gather data, and one of the first things that stood out to me was where these takeovers were happening, right? And so here's a map of just selected takeovers. And just to note, uh, at the time that I'm writing this, this book and doing this research, uh, Gary Indiana was not going through the same uh, experience as these other cities, so you won't see it here. And I won't, uh, my data will not capture the Gary experience, but we can certainly talk about how um, the experience of these other cities fit into the, the experience that, that the community in Gary has experienced and, and, and potentially will experience, right? So from looking at uh, some of the cities that experienced takeovers, right? If you look at this map, for anyone who's studied, you know, um, or interested in urban politics and interested in race politics, these cities pop at it. Um, these are cities where, you know, the fight for political power, particularly among African American communities, um, where it was was center, um, was uh, vigorously fought over in the 1960s and 1970s, right? And so by the time that, you know, we see some of these takeovers here happening, whether it's the 19, 1990s, um, early 2000s, it, these cities stick out at you. And then the other part that stuck out at me, uh, the kind of puzzle that emerges from my preliminary research is that I began to look into um, uh, school board types. And so it's important to note that when a state takes over a local school district, the school board is uh, treated in one of three ways. One, the, the city, the community gets to keep the locally elected school board. Uh, that's one option. Another option is that the school board is abolished and uh, replaced with a state appointed board. And then there's a third option, which is the, the school board is abolished and not replaced at all. And so when we look at how these are affecting the different communities, um, it, you know, it stands out. So here we have majority white districts that have experienced state takeovers, majority Latino districts that have experienced state takeovers, and majority black districts that have experienced state takeovers. Um, the blue here represents when takeovers happen, when the, the school board remains elected. Um, the orange represents uh, the uh, school board being abolished, but then being replaced with an appointed board. And then the gray represents a school board that is abolished and not replaced at all. So although um, majority white districts uh, are less, far less likely to experience a, a state takeover, we see that in about 70% of cases when they are taken over, they get to keep their elected board. Right, the elected school board. Um, for majority Latino communities, about 45% get to keep their elected board. But for majority Black communities, uh, districts, they only get to keep their school board, um, uh, elected school board in about 23% of cases. And so for the 70% uh, of cases, their school boards are abolished. And for about 33% of cases there in communities that ex, uh, majority black communities that experience state takeovers, they don't have a school board at all. And some of these uh, are happening in places in the South, right, in the cradle of, of, of the civil rights movement, where states are taking over these local school districts and not having a school board at all, right? So that is part of um, uh, the, this preliminary data gathering that I was uh, conducting. This stood out to me. And then another thing that stood out to me was. Um, I started doing a case study in Newark, New Jersey. And when I um, began to do the preliminary research uh, to, to help me understand what was happening with the Newark experience, and I should add that Newark, New Jersey is one of the first um, districts to experience a takeover across the country. So New Jersey was the first state to pass a state, law, a state takeover law. And uh, the Jersey City Schools in New Jersey were the first to be taken over in 1989. The Newark Public Schools were taken over in 1995. And uh, so in trying to understand what the Newark experience was with the takeover, I read 
everything that the state had written about the state takeover or leading up to the state takeover to justify it. Uh, I had read what the newspapers, whether local or national, had to say about the Newark takeover. And um, all of these, um, uh, all of this research had shown that um, there, there was a consensus that was being uh, established, created about the need to take over the Newark schools. Because at some level, the community was failing to produce an adequate education for the children of Newark, right? So that was the consensus that was being, uh, that was established as a result uh, of, 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 these, of these documents, right? But in attending, uh, doing research in Newark, attending school board meetings in Newark, um, so here's a picture of a school board meeting back in uh, 2012, in the 2012, 2013 school year. On average, there were 300 people attending school board meetings in Newark that year, right? So all of the school board meetings were packed and energized and people were engaged, right? And here's some more images about what we saw happening in Newark that year. And so in addition to attending these school board meetings and seeing that experience, that political experience for that community and talking to organizers, young and old, uh, community leaders, elected officials, parents, teachers. For me, what I was observing was something very different than what the literature or the documents had indicated about this, the, the city of Newark and its schools. That to me, I was seeing a community that was very much engaged in uh, trying to uh, improve education for their children. And in talking to organizers who have been doing this for a very long time, elders in the, in the city of Newark, they said that this was no different than what they had done in the past, right? In the past 30, 40 years, they have been, this type of engagement has always been part of the Newark political experience. And so for me, this also was a puzzle um, that although the, the argument, the consensus was that somehow the community was failing its children, here was some evidence in my view from the observations I was making that the community was very much invested in the education of the children and that something else might be at work here, right? And, and so these led to these research questions, right? So why take over in the first place, right? We have roughly uh, 13,000 school districts in this country. And so not all of, uh, overwhelmingly, um, uh, these school districts, even many of them are not doing well academically, they're not being taken over. So trying to understand why are we taking over in the first place? Why do state takeovers disproportionately affect black communities? And additionally, why do Black communities disproportionately experience the most punitive forms of a state takeover, right? Because there is this option where communities don't lose their elected school board and that the elected school board you know, is, is, um, is working with the state to, to, to improve education, right? That's not what we see happening in majority Black communities. And so in addition to that, there was another puzzle for me. Right. Uh, so I, again, as I'm collecting data, finding out where takeovers are happening, one of the things that I learned about is that, you know, in order for a state to take over a school district, it has to have a law that allows that to happen. Right. And so this is as of 2015, all of the states that had passed laws to allow a state takeover of the local schools. And um, the overwhelming majority of these laws were being passed by Republican governors. Right, overwhelmingly. Um, and so this led to the research question, which is, you know, why would Republican state officials take the lead in proposing state takeover laws and initiating state takeovers of local school districts when the ideological and conservative principles would suggest an approach that favors local control rather than state centralization? So if you're, you know, if you're a student of politics and, you know, you just, you know, or just, you know, follow politics, you know that part of the con conservative ideology and particularly Republican ideology is favoring local control, um, saying that, you know, uh, get the state or, you know, the, 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 the federal government out of our business in some way, right? And so why is it that Republican governors are, are leading the charge in taking over local school districts? It seems to be inconsistent with the ideology, right, and party preferences. So, um, to learn, to try to answer these questions, I first began to dig deeper into the Newark experience. And my goal here was, let me learn about how Newark experienced the takeover, what led to the takeover in Newark and how has it impacted the city of Newark, to then establish some hypotheses that I can test beyond Newark to see if they apply 
um, across uh, state uh, takeover experiences, right? And so the first thing about Newark, you, you know, it's important. To, um, what I did is, is, is pick up and really try to dig into what was happening in the 1960s. So this is a critical period in understanding the emergence of state takeover, the state takeover experience in Newark, right? And so in the 1960s, by the mid-1960s, African-Americans came to represent the majority of the population in the city of Newark. However, they had uh, essentially no political power, right? Mem no members on the school board, uh, no members on the city council, um, uh, and obviously didn't have uh, uh, a black mayor. And the, in, in 1967, uh, a school board seat became available. And at the time, the mayor appointed members to the school board. And the African-American community in Newark had demanded that that seat that vacancy be filled with an African-American member on the school board. And the, uh, the mayor at the time decided not to appoint uh, a black member to the school board. And so the school board meetings were filled with people in anger. And what uh, the head of the NAACP said at the time was that if there, um, if we don't get a, a black member appointed to the school board, there will be blood in the streets of Newark, right? And so just a couple of weeks later, after that incident, there was blood on the streets of Newark, right? So Newark had one of the deadliest urban uprisings in the history of the United States in, in 1967. Uh, and the, there was, it, after that uh, report, I'm, I'm sorry, after that incident, the, uh, governor of the state of New Jersey appointed a, co a commission to study the effects, of the, the causes of what they call a riot. In Newark, they call it a rebellion. Um, and the Governor Select Commission on Civil Disorder attributed the controversial school board appointment as one of the factors that helped, the quote unquote, helped set the stage for the July riot, right? And in addition to referencing lack of representation on the school board as a key factor, the report also cited the state of educational crisis in the Newark public schools. So the dropout rate was at 32%, the dilapidated buildings and the shortage of teaching personnel. And equally as important, or just equally as troubling, by the mid 1960s, the Newark public schools did not have the physical space to educate every Newark student. So these were the conditions that the African American community was experiencing in the city of Newark politically and educationally, a system that was failing its children, right? And so by the 19, uh, late 1960s, these conditions are existing. Um, uh, the Black community starts to gain political power in the city of Newark. And they, by 1970, elect the first um, uh, Black mayor, Ken Gibson, and they have members on the city council, members on the school board, and they start to address many of these uh, uh, issues for the community, right? And one of the things that starts to happen outside of that is that these communities, urban communities in the state of New Jersey, are filing lawsuits to have more resources for their local public schools, right? And so what we see in New Jersey, and New Jersey becomes a leader in this, is that communities like Newark, communities like Jersey City, are uh, filing lawsuits saying that the, the way that school, schools are funded is unconstitutional. And we need more resources to equally um, provide equal education opportunities to, to our students. And they start to win. And they start to win these court cases, right? And so here, what, we, what I'm showing here is New Jersey state funding for public education from 1969 to 1996. Um, we see increases in, in funding after 1969, but these go increasingly uh, uh, become sharper by the mid to late 1980s, right? The, 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 because of a result of these uh, successful lawsuits, um, the funding for public education in New Jersey, particularly for low resource communities, starts to increase significantly in the state of New Jersey. And so what this leads to is tension between the urban communities, urban low resource communities that are getting these, uh, these new dollars to finally um, fund education in an equitable fashion, right? And so there's a tension with them and the su uh, suburbs, the wealthy suburbs in the state of New Jersey who are feeling resentful that they're seeing their tax dollars go to these public schools. And so here we have um, 
uh, Newark Superintendent Eugene Campbell, who's saying when these dollars are starting to come in in the, the late 1980s, saying 28 districts would be receiving a significant increase in funds. The children of New Jersey stand to benefit by this change in funding to school districts in need. So this is the Newark super, uh, superintendent saying, we welcome these dollars for the first time our districts like Newark are getting the resources that they need to adequately educate their children, right? But then you have John Dorsey, the Republican Senate minority leader from Morris, one of the wealthier districts in New Jersey, stated that the new funding formula required working class people in middle class communities who drive around in Fords to buy Mercedes for people in the poorest cities because they don't have cars, right? So this is that tension that we see playing out between these urban communities, which are mostly uh, majority African-American and the suburban communities, wealthier communities that are majority white and they're fighting over school funding, right? So this is the New Jersey experience, that tension that by 1989, turns into um, what, what um, happens in other places. So that's happening in New Jersey. And what's happening in New Jersey is happening across the country. So here, what I'm showing you now is total publication, uh, pu public education dollars in billions from 1977 to 1993. And as we saw dollars for education increase in New Jersey in the 1980s, we see dollars for public education across the country increase significantly in the 1980s as well, right? And this is a result, again, of um, demands for more resources for schools. And what I'm showing you here, the, the blue line is still the same as the, you know, the public funding for um, education across the country. And the orange line signifies, uh, represents here student uh, enrollment, right? And so you see how the orange line is, is, remains relatively stable. That just means that, you know, a student enrollment across the country has been relatively stable. So increases in dollars is not because we get the surge in new students enrolled. Uh, that has remained relatively stable, but dollars have increased, right? And so this, again, is consistent with what we saw happening in, uh, in Newark and in New Jersey throughout the 1980s, right? And then finally, we see a study of uh, fiscal year budgets for states shows that by the mid to late 1980s, a public uh, funding for public education represented the largest percentage of, of state's budgets, right? So in 1987, what I'm showing here is in the blue, you see funding for elementary and secondary education represents roughly 23% of, of, of state's budget, right? And so what this leads is to state government to respond to these conditions. And so by the 1980s, governors start to assume a greater authority over local schools. And at the 1986 annual meeting of the National Governors Association, the governor, governors announced a plan that would be part of a second wave of reform in American public education and introduced the policy of state takeovers of districts that failed to meet toughened minimum standards. So it's in 1986 that we first see this language about state takeovers, and it's these governors that are the ones pushing for this. And so let's you know, um, you know, wrestle with that for a second. You have a black superintendent of a majority black school district in Newark who's saying by 1986, 87, and 98, that for the first time, their district and 27 other districts are getting the resources that they need to actually improve education. At the same time that they're saying this, these national governors are saying, uh, we need to toughen our standards because these communities are not adequately educating their children, right? And so what I argue that what emerges is this conservative education logic. And you know, so, so part of the conservative response was to promote a logic which professed an interest in improving education for black students at the same time that it invested in the political disempowerment of the Black community. And so from that perspective, then it starts to make sense why we see that the majority of states that are passing state takeover laws are being led by, these, these, these efforts are being led by Republican governors. And in addition to that, we see that the same kind of, um, um, experience in New Jersey is happening across the country. 
when it comes to school funding and takeovers, right? So school funding in New Jersey increases in the mid to late 1980s and New Jersey passes a state takeover law in 1989. And this is kind of consistent with what we see happening across the board. So here we see school funding plaintiff, plaintiff victories between 1980 and 2000. In that time span, there were 18 states where plaintiffs won lawsuits to secure more resources for their schools. In 14 out of those 18 states, states passed takeover laws um, following those, those lawsuits. The, there are four states where that did not happen, and those four states are Montana, uh, North Dakota, Vermont, and Wyoming. Uh, you, know, you don't need to be an expert in uh, you know, population or uh, uh, demographics to understand that these are some of the um, uh, whitest states in the country, right? So with that foundation, I wanted to then do a further analysis to try to understand the factors that are associated with a takeover of a school district um, uh, occurring. So again, there are about 13,000 school districts in this country. The overwhelming majority of them do not experience a takeover, although many of them do struggle academically. And so I was thinking, uh, let's do an analysis and try to find out what are the political factors, economic factors that may be associated with a state takeover. So I created uh, an original data set of state takeover uh, districts, in addition to other districts that have not been experienced, uh, uh, districts that have not experienced a takeover. And so this original data set is between 1990, uh, school districts between 1991 and 2006. And I rely on these different data sources for, for, for my data, the Education Commission of the States, the US Census and several other um, uh, outlets, right? And so I run a model uh, with a dependent variable of takeover, meaning uh, zero representing a time where the, the, uh, the district was not taken over and one representing a district that was taken over. I run logistic regression and there's 988 districts in this analysis. <clears throat> Here are my independent variables. I include several empowerment variables, whether a city has a black mayor or not, a Latino mayor or not, what percentage of the city council in that city is represented by black members, what percentage is represented by Latino uh, members, uh, city population, city percentage of population black, Latino and white, school district total population, um, district population that's black, Latino and white, and equally as important to this analysis, revenue. So what percentage of the revenue um, what's the amount of revenue that comes in from a local source for that school district? What is the amount that comes in from a state source? And what is the amount that comes from the federal government? And then finally, I include uh, a control measure for to test for poverty, to, to get a sense of what percentage of the students uh, in that district are, are low income. And so I use this, this variable, district percent free lunch, to control for that. And so after doing the analysis, there are two um, variables, the two strongest variables uh, connected with the likelihood of a takeover happening is one, how much state dollars go into a public school district, right? So as public uh, state dollars increase, the likelihood of a takeover increases as well. And the strongest indicator of a uh, predictor, I should say, of a state takeover occurring is the percentage of black city council membership at, in, this, in a city that experiences a takeover. So if you have a community where there are no black members on the city council, you have about a three to 4% likelihood of experiencing a state takeover. By the time that community has about 100% city council members, which in many majority African-American cities, that's what we experience. The, the likelihood, the percentage increases to 15% that that district is gonna experience a, a, a takeover. So the two strongest variables associated with the likelihood of a takeover occurring are how many, how much, uh, uh, how many resources, uh, the amount of dollars that are coming from state government to the district and the percent of black city council members uh, represented in that city, right? So those are the two factors that are strong, strongly associated. So with that, um, here are, in, in my view, the implications of, of these findings, that states began to take over school districts precisely at a moment when school districts were beginning to get the resources that communities demand. 
The emergence of state takeovers in the 1980s and 1990s represents a shift uh, uh, from the idea that of uh, the undeserving black student, an idea that was systematically challenged in the 1950s and 1960s, to a focus on the undeserving stewards of the education of black children. So the community, the local leaders and so forth. And the collision, the political collision between state governments and urban communities that create the conditions for a takeover are incapable of producing the collaborative environment that is necessary for sustainable school improvement. So we know from the research that in order that the school systems which perform the best are those where you have participation and communities, parents, teachers, uh, leaders working together. Takeovers do not pro provide that type of environment, the type of conditions. And finally, the systematic political disempowerment of Black communities through a state takeover of local school districts shows how education is central to the project of state sanctioned political inequality. Because too often we think of education as just being the, the mechanism to improve uh, economic and political conditions and that um, everyone is in the best interest of, of these communities and their education. But by looking at takeovers, it provides a lens complicating that, right? That there are that there is enough evidence, I think, through this research and other folks' research, that education is not just that not, not everyone is interested in the well-being and the education of these communities, particularly for students from black communities, right? And so we need to think about um, education being a source of producing inequality, not just uh, reducing inequality. Uh, and so with that, uh, we'll stop there and we can begin to take questions. So thank you, um, Professor Morell. Just a, a few observations and we're gonna go to some questions in the q and A. I I wanna remind uh, everyone that if you do have a question, please post that question in the QA, Q and A section so that we can then um, address, your, uh, address your interests and your concerns. And so first off, I just wanna say thank, thank you for helping us to better understand the historical context of this issue. Um, through that examination, you've been able to identify some critical factors. Uh, we didn't have this information prior to your research. And I think that sets a foundation for discussion and then also for communities to plan for the future. It also connects communities. I don't know that many of us understood the, the extent of this, um, the movement that has taken place across the country and the tensions that have surrounded that. So I just wanna make that observation and then go to our first uh, question. And the first question is this, Newark just regained control after 22 years. The most successful strategy they developed was to have a solid plan in place for the district to actually regain control. Do you agree that should be next the next step for Gary, Indiana? Well, so what I would say, I mean, there's a lot, uh, there are many, many factors that led to the return of local control in Newark. One of them being, of course, that plan, right? Um, but I would add several things to that as well. Uh, so in Newark, you had um, a mayor. Uh, so, you know, we had a history of, um, for several years, of course, had Cory Booker as, as mayor, and he was not seen as um, like a pro-community mayor that was fighting for local control. In fact, Cory Booker was very much working with um, uh, Governor Christie and others to essentially promote the, the um, the presence of the state in, in Newark. And so when Raz Baraka decides to run for mayor, he makes return to local control a center feature of his candidacy, right? So in ways that other mayors before him had not done. And so he had campaigned on working with the community to demand for the local control of its schools. So that's one important part here. Another important part is that the community continued to resist Right, as I showed from the, um, you know, the, the, the pictures in the 2012-2013 school year where the community was resisting, that was an important part of it. And then there's, an, there's a, um, a very interesting national political uh, uh, experience here as well. So what happened, and, and it's connected to student mobilization, 
So what happened um, when Chris Christie decides that he wants to run for uh, a president of the United States, one of his selling points was that he was a Republican governor in a majority Democratic um, uh, state. And that worked well with Democratic cities, right? And that was part of his selling point to the, the Republican Party for a, a why he should be the nominee. And what was happening in Newark is that these young kids who were taking over um, the, 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 the school administration building, they walked out of schools and shut down major highways in Newark. They, this was happening precisely at the time where Chris Christie was uh, about to announce his presidency, his run for presidency. And so this became a problematic, a problematic narrative for that story that Chris Christie wanted to tell. And so that forced Chris Christie to work with Raz Baraka to come up with a plan for the return of local control. So you have these political factors, right? The students mobilizing, a mayor that comes in making these demands, right? So these are the political conditions. And so eventually it leads to the people coming to the table and then having um, uh, this plan to uh, that that's going to transition, going to transition Newark from state control to local control. So it is true, the question, uh, the premise of the question, it is true that this happens, but there's all these other factors, political factors that are happening that provides the conditions for that to happen. So in the case of Gary, you know, so I'm, I'm learning more and more about the Gary experience. One of the things that I would um, add is that part of what made the return to local control in Newark may be what is necessary in Gary as well and in other cities, which is the political mobilization of the students, the political mobilization of local leaders, and these local leaders working across cities to create the political conditions to bring people back to the table to return local control to the schools, <clears throat> to the city. So Professor Morell, uh, related to that, there was a question on community resistance. I think you've spoken to that. I just want to point that out. But the question specifically was, does community resistance mean not strategically working with those who have currently um, who currently do have control of the school system? I don't know if you want to expand on your answer or you feel like you've answered that question as well. Yeah, so, uh, so I think it's important, you know, every community has um, its, its um, it, it, it's its own experience with local politics, with state politics, right? And so I think that the local organizers need to determine what is their best strategy to go forward. There are times where, in the case of Newark, where local the local community worked with state officials who were uh, who controlled the school. So that that is part of the story as well. But then, and you know, the return to local control, the important part of the story here is that the communities felt that what was happening um, was harmful to their community, that they had a governor who was not being responsive to their demands and to their needs. And so that created the impetus for this type of resistance, the walkouts, the takeovers of buildings, and so forth, right? And so I think that it's uh, important for community organizers and, 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 and the leaders in Gary to determine their own strategies. But um, the case of Newark shows us that there are multiple strategies to resist this, this experience. <clears throat> mm -hmm. All right, and so related, related to that, if you're, um, I think you're familiar already that Muncie was taken over. It's another um, district that was taken over in the state of Indiana. And so the question is, um, as Muncie was taken over at approximately the same time, and their takeover is now over, but ours drags on, um, what power do the people of Gary have? And so some of these questions are related, but I wanted specifically to give you the opportunity to comment and, and reflect on Muncie versus uh, Gary. Yeah, so, um, so I, I, I don't know enough about so I know of the Muncie experience and of course the Gary experience and so I don't know enough about the details to be able to comment you know, at any um, extensive level of, 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 of knowledge about the difference between the two. But what I would say is that you know, to the, uh, the latter part of that question of what folks in Gary need to do, um, it is a difficult circumstance for cities um, like Gary in a, in a state that is controlled by Republicans, right? And so my research shows that this is Republican led against cities which are not only majority black, but happen to be majority democratic in most cases as well, right? And so that the political um, leverage that 
let's say a Raz Baraka in the city of Newark has with a um, Democratic governor like Phil Murphy does not exist for members of the Gary community. Right. And in fact, you know, so I argue that part of what we saw happen in Flint, Michigan, for instance, right, where you have um, the Republican governor essentially um, uh, putting people in place that made these horrible decisions that affected the residents of this of the city of Flint, that 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 happened because the the Republican governor did not see the residents of the city of, of Flint as someone that uh, a, a group of people that um, he had to be accountable to. Right. In the same way that Chris Christie was not, uh, did not feel that Newark residents, uh, he had to be accountable to the Newark residents because Newark didn't, Newarkers didn't vote for Chris Christie, right? And so he didn't need to win an election for, um, uh, for governor based on Newark voters. And so he was able to move forward an agenda that was harmful to that community without being accountable to that community. And so uh, the, the struggle is that Gary is in that same situation. You have state leaders who are the ones responsible for governance in, in Gary based on the takeover, and they are not necessarily accountable to the voters of Gary. And so what, what I see happening in other places is that communities try to coalesce with other communities. Um, so Gary coalescing with other cities that may be experiencing the same or may be threatened to experience the same and try to mobilize and gain numbers in that in that way. And so this is part of the strategy that I think people need to be thinking about is how is it that we can come together with other communities across the state of Indiana to try to put pressure at the state level. And if that's not successful, which is very difficult in a state like Indiana, right, is trying to bring a, a national conversation, bring national attention to what's happening in, in Gary to try to bring pressure from, um, from outside and from other uh, outlets to try to provide the political conditions to try to um, uh, resist this. And finally, I would say, um, I think an important part of this too is the possibility of the courts playing a role here. Uh, not only state courts, but the federal courts. Uh, so I argue in the book, right, so for the most part, state takeovers of school districts, um, uh, courts have supported these takeovers, saying that states have the right and have the, the constitutional right to intervene in these ways, right? But then now we have enough data to show how communities are being uh, politically disenfranchised by these takeovers. And so while the, the courts have agreed that states have the powers to intervene, I argue that states, that states do not have the power to politically disenfranchise these communities. And so that we need to be thinking about 14th Amendment protections, so equal protection um, uh, lawsuits to defend the rights of people, uh, uh, members, uh, citizens, like in Gary and other places, who do not have the right, do not, do not have the ability to govern their own schools, a political right. Uh, because it's being disenfranchised by the state government. So I think that's another avenue that we need to be exploring more and more at the national level to think about ways that the courts could come in and, and, and support communities like Gary. And another uh, question that we have, um, I just want to acknowledge first that we do have individuals who are joining us via streaming on Facebook. And so there, um, if after you answer this question, we can go back to map that you actually presented at the beginning of the presentation and just read off those places on the map um, that were the subject of takeovers, you know, so I'll just put that in and raise that issue right now so you can think about that as we answer this question. It says, it appears that when local school corporations meet the requirements, the Republican governors may move the goalpost so they can push their agenda and keep control. How will it benefit the Republicans or Democrats to actually turn back history? Um, so turn back history, maybe um, I may need a little bit of help with that. So I'm not, I'm not understanding that part about the turning back history. Okay. Um, so we can ask our guests to please clarify for us so that, yeah, we can, yeah. um, so that we can take a closer look at that question. And then um, are you able to bring up the map again by any chance? Yeah, we can. Take a look Give at that. One. And then uh, could you read off the cities, do you mind, with the years so that the listeners who aren't able to see the PowerPoint would, would know where that, those uh, takeovers were taking place? Yeah, so this is um, just selected cities. Um, so we have, as of the time of writing of this book, we had about 100 cities that experienced state takeovers. 
And so in this map, what I'm showing are selected cities, right? And so we have uh, the city of Boston, which experienced a takeover in 1991, right? So oftentimes the city of Boston uh, is not considered a, a city that experienced a takeover, but in 1991, the state took over the right um, to elect a board, took that right away from the local citizens in Boston um, and gave that power to the mayor. So that is a takeover. And the same thing happened in New York City in 2002. So we have Boston 1991, Detroit 1999, Chicago 1995, Newark 1995, the District of Columbia, so Washington DC experienced a takeover itself from the national government that is in 1995. Baltimore experiences a takeover in 1997. Uh, Compton, California, 1993. Oakland, California, 2003. New Orleans, 2003. St. Louis, 2008. Uh, Philadelphia, 2001. And so these are just some selected cities that have experienced a takeover. <clears throat> and are you aware of the, um... What minority, what majority white school districts have been taken over? Were you able? Yeah, to so those majority white school districts we find in uh, primarily two states in West Virginia and Kentucky, and these happened um, in the 1990s, 1990s and early 2000s. So I don't remember off the top of my head the names of those school districts, but they mostly happen in those two states. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. And here's a question on um, the status of the community with respect to its perspective on takeover. So when the community is divided on the issue of whether or not the takeover and its principal partners are effective in improving the educational outcomes for our children, as is the case in Gary, what is your prescription to unify the community and get everybody on the same page? Yeah. So, you know, I think for me, part of that answer is, you know, try to go back that, you know, try to go back into history to try to understand how other experience, how other communities have experienced the same type of question. And so what I found um, in Newark and in other places was that at the time of the takeover, uh, you know, communities are, are desperate to improve their schools. They want to do whatever they can to improve the schools. And so at the times that these takeovers are happening for the first time across the country, to many members of these communities, the state coming in was a welcomed idea, right? Because they knew very little about what takeovers were going to amount to and the state saying, we're gonna come in and help. And so who, um, who's not going to be in support of that, right? If the goal is to improve the schools. But soon thereafter, two, three years after these uh, takeover experiences, communities realized that the state takeover is actually not what they thought it was, right? And so from, from the research, we know that the best education systems, right, are those systems where people work together across the board. It's political, so there's not going to be full agreement on anything, right? That's just impossible. And you get that in every school district in the country, whether, you know, it's one of the best performing and one of the lowest performing, you're going to get um, a political um, contestation, right? Um, but still, those school districts that do the best are those where people work together, work collaboratively. And the community is an essential part of it. So the parents are an essential part of it. The local leaders from the school board to the city council, community organizations, they're all part of it. And so what takeovers have become, what, what they are, but what people didn't know at the time was, it's a policy where it says the people who are closest, the, who the, the schools are supposed to serve, we're going to separate them from the equation. Right? We're going to take them out of the equation. So whether it's the school board, community organizations, and others, they are seen as the problem and a barrier to improving the schools. Now, because that type of um, mentality is only um, relegated uh, uh, overwhelmingly to Black communities, that has to, we have to think about that as a racist idea, that somehow that the improvement of community of uh, school districts that are majority black requires the removal of the community organizations, the school boards, the local leaders from decision-making abilities in order to improve the school. We only are, accept that in these majority um, black communities and increasingly majority Latino communities, right? That in these other communities, that's, that, that's never accepted as, 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 as an, uh, uh, is never an acceptable idea. 
that somehow you improving the schools requires and pushing me out of the way, me being the community, me being the parents, the community organizations and so forth. And so what I would urge people who are in Gary, which of course people, everyone is interested in improving uh, education, you know, from uh, 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 taking that, that standpoint on that question, um, that those who want to improve education, how is it that they do this, right? If you're interested in improving education, my argument is that the solution to improving education cannot involve pushing the community out of the way. That it has to be one that says the community is part of the solution rather than part of uh, the, the reason why our schools are not doing well. And so takeovers are uh, what, they, what, they, what they're for is to push communities out of the way rather than include communities. And so that's why um, I think based on my research, I think we need to think about different ways to um, support communities like Gary and others who, who want to improve their schools, but uh, find themselves in a situation where the schools um, you know, are in the conditions and situation that they're in. So earlier you mentioned that it would be valuable to, um, to look to other districts within the state of Indiana. There's a question that um, since we are neighbors to Illinois and Chicago, the question is asking, do you feel that, that we should partner with Chicago? Well, so I think, um, you know, of course this is, you know, the, the local organizers um, have to make these decisions. I'm not aware of the type of uh, relationships that exist there, although there's close in proximity, I'm not exactly sure what these uh, connections look like. But it would seem to me that there should be, um, although you know it's a different state, that there should be leveraging of resources, of knowledge, of um, of, of of energy that the that uh, Gary can benefit from uh, because that type of mobilizing, that type of, um, of political mobilization has been such a central part to, of the Chicago uh, education uh, experience, right? And so it would seem to me that because it's so close in proximity, that there are many things that the two communities share. And one of those things I think would be to come together to support each other and, 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 and mobilizing for the kind of things that um, uh, uh, citizens of, of Gary want, right? And so, uh, again, I think, you know, I, I don't know enough about what those ties look like, what those uh, links between Chicago and Gary look uh, look like in the moment, but it would seem to me that it would make a lot of sense um, for, for the communities to work together uh, to, to try to um, uh, arrive at solutions for the conditions in Gary. <clears throat> All right, and our, our next set of questions is related to charter schools. Um, there were two questions. I'm going to try and combine them here. And with the, as you may know already, charter schools are, um, there are quite a few charter schools in the city of Gary at this point in time. Um, that is a community view. And so there's a two-part question, you know, one, how does this impact the um, the outcome of our, of the takeover of Gary and is there any similarity between that you have found between the increase in the number of charter schools in the community and takeovers? Yeah, so um, there is a, an excellent book written by a Michigan State professor named Sarah Reckow, where she she examines uh, it's called Follow the Money. And where she examines um, like outside dollars, you know, private foundation dollars, and and education policies, right? And what she finds is that there is a link between takeovers and 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 private money coming into the schools. In other words, you know, these private foundations that are oftentimes connected with charter schools. So there is an empirical link there that she makes between the the. Um, Takeovers of a, takeovers of school districts and the increased presence of private foundations in in private uh, interests in the schools, like charter schools. So what I would say from my experience and my um, uh, research is that you know in many of these communities, charter schools communities are resisting these charter schools, right? Um, and partly because of the, the teachers, politics, and others, right? And so the, the charter school um, uh, politics becomes easier. The, the, the politics of expanding charter schools becomes easier 
when a state takeover happens because the resistance is removed from the equation. So whether it's the, you know, a school board that is being supportive, um, you know, not as supportive to the expansion of charter schools, well, with the state takeover, that is removed. The presence of these other leaders that, that traditionally will have a role in having um, uh, in, in school policies and education policies in the district, once they're removed out of the way, the resistance is moved out of the way. So it creates a pathway for the types of, of, of policies like expanding charter schools to be um, uh, made politically uh, more feasible. So based on those two factors, one, the connection between charter schools and private uh, uh, presence, right? That uh, Professor Rekau from Michigan State has has, has made uh, empirically in her book. And then my research, which shows you know, how the resistance, um, it's the takeovers lead to the removal of political um, uh, uh, actors that are likely to resist these types of policies, the removal of them facilitates the expansion of charter schools. So I, I would say that this is how they're connected. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much. Um, there are a couple questions that are focused on the management companies that um, then enter the communities in, in a takeover situation. And um, one specific one question specifically is asking, you know, how do you how do you get rid of the takeover corporation? And, and specifically in our case, it would be uh, MGT in this community. And the other is related. It says that um, there, we recently passed a referendum giving money to the school district and that money is being used by the takeover corporation. And is this a setback um, for us? Um, so the way that I think I would answer this is, you know, the, the, my research has shown that in order for communities to resist these policies, um, there needs to be mobilization across entities in the city, right? And so that if the community feels that these, um, this, uh, this corporation or corporations are not being responsive, that they are um, taking away the resources that are meant for the community. So these are public resources that should be meant for the community, right? That if, it's, if, if that's not occurring, then there needs to be political resistance um, uh, from all the different aspects of the community. So the students need to step up, right? The local leaders need to step up, elected officials, um, uh, former school board members, uh, state legislators that represent this, this district, um, uh, this community, mayors and so forth, uh, community organizations, that it needs to be a collective uh, experience, uh, response to, to this. And that's what the research, my research has shown because um, rarely do we see it just happen happen because you know people decide well you know what this wasn't a good policy and we're just gonna we're just gonna leave it just doesn't happen that way it's because there have been political pressures put on people to leave so if the community feels that these corporations are are harmful are preventing um, the public from having their resources um, being dedicated to the public right that there needs to be this type of collective resistance across um, sectors in the city right and so um, I think what you know, my research helps to do, and I think this is related to something that was said earlier on one of the questions or, or something you might have mentioned, um, uh, Ellen, is that what, what I learned is that in many cities, I get invited to, to talk and my research was involved in not just in Newark, but multiple cities. And what I've learned is that cities feel like they're alone, right? And so that Part of my goal in, 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 in talking to communities about this is showing, is demonstrating how your experience is not unique. You might think it's unique. You might think that, well, we're the only ones that are struggling this way, and so therefore the state needs to come in and, and, and then feel like that it's not doing what it should be doing. You're not alone. All of these cities have experienced a similar kind of thing. Detroit has experienced it. Uh, Newark has experienced it, Philadelphia, Oakland, Compton, St. Louis, Cleveland, and we could go on and on and on. Uh, all of these cities have experienced precisely um, the, the same types of things, right? And so um, the evidence is pretty clear that this is not leading to the kind of things that you want, right? Um, we, we, we don't have uh, evidence that this is working the way that people promise or want it to work. 
the best evidence that we have is in the city of New Orleans, right? Academically speaking, um, there was research that showed that following the takeover of the New Orleans public schools, following Hurricane Katrina, that education outcomes did improve, right? Um, test scores and graduation rates and so forth in the years following the takeover. So that's the best research that we have. But my research looking at the, the politics of this in, in New Orleans shows that New Orleans was, had the largest black teaching force in the country pre-Katrina. And within 10 years, they lost over 26% of the, of the teaching force. They lost thousands of jobs that were um, from the local community. So economically, it took a hit. The school board was abolished and then it was replaced by these charter boards, which were um, majority white uh, members on these charter boards. So um, we have a majority black city with overwhelmingly majority black student population. And yet the majority of the members on these charter boards are white, right? And then polling, uh, uh, we have research, my colleague uh, Sally Niyama in Northwestern and I did research showing that um, although um, a majority of, of, of white uh, uh, New Orleans residents thought that the schools improved um, following the, the takeover after Hurricane Katrina, a majority of black parents did not think that it improved. Although the research had shown that schooling had improved in some way. And so what we're arguing is that communities not only take into account, um, you know, test scores improving, they take into account with the devastation on their community, the loss of the school board, the loss of teachers, the loss of jobs, right? Jobs like bus drivers, jobs like, um, uh, uh, crossing guards, jobs like cafeteria workers, all of these things that are important for a community, economic development, the takeover has led to the loss of these jobs, right? And the loss of these opportunities. And so we can't just think about it as plain, uh, just as simple as did we see test scores improve? However, while that, that is important, it cannot be the only thing. And then because um, um, these this, this, this devastation that the community has felt. Now, what we're seeing in New Orleans is that those improved scores that were being celebrated, applauded at the beginning, they're not holding anymore, right? That those gains that, that, that these researchers found are not, um, uh, they're starting to decrease, right? The gains have not been sustainable. And so that policy, the best example we have of a takeover working, educationally speaking, was New Orleans. And then we see in so many ways how that has been devastating to, to Black residents of the city of New Orleans, right? And so we just don't have good evidence that this is, that this is the type of policy that's going to lead to what residents of the, of the city of Gary want for their schools. <clears throat> Oh, there's so much to unpack there. I, I, I want to just make a, a common observation and, and then I want to share some of the observations from the rest of our uh, participants here. And that is, it sounds to me like what you're saying is that the community looks at education as a system and not just an output. You know, it's not just a score. It's not just, you know, having a balanced budget, but it's all of the activities that surround that, everything from local individuals having jobs to, um, to the culture of the, the institution itself, how students perform and think about themselves in the community. And that's really important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, another observation is, you know, what's, what is a typical deficiency pointed to as the impetus for school takeovers, poor academic performance, financial insolvency, or both? Um, both. That, yeah. yeah. So we see across the board both, right? And so, you know, in many of these places, we're talking about low resourced um, communities. Mm -hmm. No resource communities which struggle financially, and and so they they are um, uh, um, those who experience takeovers oftentimes have these financial challenges, right? In addition to that, they also struggle academically, and so we see we see both happening. Yeah. <clears throat> and a comment that in Gary, uh, the academic performance has actually steadily declined under the takeover and has not been strategically addressed. Have you seen that in other districts? Well, um, so my research hasn't focused a lot on the the educational aspect, but I have followed it followed it closely. And um, time after time after time, we find that these school these school um, districts do not see improvement. And in some ways, you know, in the case of Newark, uh, you know, I argued that um, outcomes were were um, were suffered because what we saw was like the cutting of social workers, 
in schools, right? Um, and so we see, uh, as a res following the years following the takeover, we see suspension rates um, uh, increase following the, the Newark takeover, right? So these are all things that when we think about outcomes, these are outcomes too, right? So if we see suspension rates increasing and mental illness, for instance, um, suffering because we're losing social workers, we're losing counselors because the state comes in and cuts these, these important uh, jobs, those are outcomes that we need to measure as well, right? And so um, while I don't follow the educational outcomes as closely as I study the political variables, it's not surprising to me that there's evidence to show that education has not improved in the traditional sense. These outcomes has improved in the years following the takeover. Um, although I'm less familiar with this, with, with, with this experience, particularly in Gary, with educational outcomes. All right, a question in, the question is in New Orleans, are all the schools charter schools? Yes, yeah, so it's a 100% um, uh, charter school, um, district first in the country okay and then an observation on um what's happening in the state uh they like to share some information that state government government has just tried to get rid of the school board there's legislation that was uh, proposed at the time um which has already been rendered powerless and to get rid of the union's bargaining power um you know sharing that that was um something that was objected to and that it's been stopped for now. So just uh, information sharing there on behalf of our participants here. Okay, um, thanks, you. thanks for that. Yeah. yeah. I'm going through a couple more uh, questions and then they'll come in. Uh, as the, um, all the emergency managers to date in Gary have been white, in a majority African American community, is this common with takeovers? So actually, it's not that common, right? Um, so one of the interesting things about in places like Newark and places like Detroit, right, and uh, you often hear from the community is because um, what the state wants to do is they want to be seen, and this particularly during the early years of the takeovers I was mentioning, the the state comes in and um, is, is saying we're going to help the community, right? And so one of the things that they do not want to seem like is in the language of the uh, participants, the people that I interviewed in, in Newark and other places, they didn't want to be seen as the overseer, right? At the, as, you know, quote unquote master or something like that. And so to avoid the appearance of that type of racial politics, they often appointed black superintendents, right? And so that's what we, have, we saw happening in, 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 um, in Newark with a black superintendent um, after the takeover. In Detroit, for instance, the, the, the manager there um, was uh, black as well. And so that is a way to attempt to um, essentially neutralize the race politics associated with this. So um, although in many places there are white superintendents or financial managers that are put in place, it's not um, in many places what we do see is that um, the superintendent is oftentimes the, the race of the majority of the community there to try to neutralize that, that uh, racial politic. However, you know, my research also shows that you know, communities, while there are some who um, you know, uh, feel like you know, having a black uh, superintendent or black uh, uh, manager uh, is beneficial and, and they will see and be more helpful to the community. There are many, many members of these communities and particularly community organizers who uh, reject that premise, right? And who, who argue that, you know, right from the beginning, we know why you're doing this. And so it has nothing to do with this black superintendent or not. It's about the politics and the policies which are harmful to our communities. And so they've rejected that, that um, you know, they see that coming. And so have, 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 um, have resisted that as well. <clears throat> and uh, we have a last question here now, um, but we you are encouraged to put more questions in the Q&A if you wish. Um, can you speak to how takeover groups have worked to um, manipulate and hire people to work for them um, who might be in a position where they uh, would feel like they're um, forced to, or uh, they're sort of paid off to do so? Well, 
what I would say is, you know, uh, people, you know, people depend on on these jobs for, you know, their 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 well being, their livelihoods, to, you know, support themselves, right? And so when the when a different administration comes in, when the state administration comes in, and they're the ones that control the dollars, and your jobs is dependent on that, I, we see that all of the time. That people follow that plan, um, you know, follow that, um, you know, whatever whoever's in power, whatever decision that they're making, because following that require um, is the, the their job is dependent on following that that plan. And so we see that happening across the board, and and even though some people resist, you know. Uh, uh, workers, whether they're teachers or, you know, just members of, of central administration, while they may resist publicly or and sometimes not as publicly, um, they, this is part of part of their reality of, you know, dealing with those who are in control and control the resources, right? And so because those resources are so vital to the community, um, you know, those bus drivers, those, you know, uh, teachers, those cafeteria workers depend on this, and so they're they're you know they're, they they have to follow, um uh you know as follow the 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 program as it is. Well, I would I, what I would say based on my research as well is that um oftentimes what we see is um the the increased level of of consultants, for instance, who are not people from the community, people from outside. So that's what we saw happening in Newark, um, and one of the things that community resented. That these resources that were supposed to be dedicated to the community, um, there were firings, firings of people who lived in the city of New York, and those jobs are being replaced with consultants from the city of New York, for instance, right? And so that money was leaving the city of New York. And so that is also consistent with what we saw happening in New York and other places. All right. Um, at this time, what we would like to do is to um, share with you a few resources, the CURE email, the website, uh, our Facebook site, and also the YouTube channel where this is going to be placed. I, I want to sincerely thank you, Professor Morell, for spending the evening with us and sharing with us your research on this important topic that touches our community. And um, take this opportunity to encourage everybody to stay engaged. And once again, Professor Morell, if, if you wanna share a few words with us as we uh, conclude our program this evening, it would greatly appreciate it and thank you again. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me and for all of the, the viewers out there. Um, I think the only thing I would uh, add is you know so this is obviously critically important to your community and so i i i, I you know uh, thank you for inviting me so we can learn more about these experiences across the country to and my hope is that it helps you think through uh, um, strategies to 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 get to where you want to get to as a community and so uh the city of, of gary has a rich history in the the trajectory of black political power in this country of course, um, uh, much like the city of Newark, right, in the 1960s and 1970s, providing the, 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 the platform for conversations on Black political power and, and, and education as, as an important part of Black political power. Gary has played an important part in this. And I believe that through your mobilization, your continued um, uh, activism for your, your community, your children, that you can also provide uh, a pathway for others who are trying to, to, to do the best and to resist these types of policies that are so harmful to your community. So uh, I wish you the best of luck and um, you can count on my support as you, you know, think through strategies to, to, to improve your, your communities and your schools. <clears throat> thank you, Professor Morell, and thank you to all the attendees who joined us this evening. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>